Come on then, little man. There we go, there we go. Oh, we're live, Kim. Yes, we're live. Hello, everybody. Um, just trying to sort out my studio cat, Banjo, who's um, always waits until I start streaming to demand to be in and out. Are you going to say hello to everybody? It's all right. Oh, you want to sit down there? Okay, we'll have a sit down there. All right. He doesn't want to say hello today. I think it, the winter's getting to him. He's an old man now, you know. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the session. Hello, Fran. Nice to see you. Ciao, Tasha. Um, I think everything is set up. I'm just looking at my cameras, and I think my main camera is a little bit too... I think the colour balance is a bit too warm, maybe. Let's try dropping that a bit. There we go. Hello, Ginia. Nice to see you. So today is going to be um, probably a fairly short one, as these things generally go for me. Um, maybe half an hour, an hour. We'll see. Probably an hour, because I'm going to do some colour mixing as well. Um, so today I've got this, which is a value study which was painted um, actually hello Francis this is the first time you've been here I think isn't it or the first time you said hello anyway I'm very happy to see someone from Denmark here hello Judy so this is yeah this is um let me move it up a bit hopefully it won't fall off a value study that was done a few weeks ago now, it was part of a workshop that I gave, which is all about painting. Not painting things, but painting light and shadow shapes and soft edges. Here is the squash in question. It's still around. <laughs> it almost made it into a new painting today, actually, but not, not quite. So what I'm going to do today is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this with oil. I'm going to do that now, actually. When I say oil, I mean linseed oil. So I'm going to oil it out. So this is completely dry to the touch. So I'm going to try and... Um, I mean, I tried to paint this quite expressively anyway. You know, all of the edges are soft, with the exception of a couple of harder edges here and, and one single hard edge there, where the, um, the edge of the form is against the shadow. Um... And I love this soft kind of feel. And this edge here of the squash is just completely obliterated, which is something that I think um, can give paintings a lot more life. Uh, it's almost as if, since your mind has to make up the edge that you can't see, you become involved in the construction of the, of the image which is a little bit how we see in real life. We don't actually look at everything at once. We take a few little reference points and then our brains make up the rest. So this is a makeup brush, makeup sponge. This is just normal linseed oil, cold pressed linseed oil, dabbing it off a little bit. So I'm gonna give this a coat of linseed oil. What can happen when they've been standing for a while, like this one has, is when you go to put the oil on, it sometimes doesn't, it kind of beads up a little bit on the surface and doesn't quite cover up first. So I kind of push it in a little bit. So you really need to make sure, obviously the painting needs to be touch dry completely before you do this. You know, or it um, will smudge it all, which wouldn't be good. So I know you can't really see this going on, but what I do when I'm putting this on, putting the oil layer on, I look kind of from the side so that I can see. So I've got some glare, you know, with a light on the other side of the painting. So I've got some glare and I can see. Um, the 
it, how well it's covering. It takes a little while sometimes. I find, depending on how long, I think a lot of it depends on how long the painting's been sitting. This one's been sitting for quite a long time. So the plan that I've got for this, that I'm going to, um, I don't know, it's starting to take now. That I'm going to do today is I'm going to, in all of the shadow areas, which is like around here, around here, and here, I'm going to glaze. Megan says, when I oiled, when I oiled mine, it rubbed some of the painting off, so I don't think it was completely dry. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful about that when you're oiling out. Like I wouldn't do it the next day. I'd usually leave it like minimum two days, you know. But sometimes what I do if I'm working on bigger paintings is I won't oil out the whole thing. I'll just oil out the area that I'm working on that day. I've actually got a big dribble of, I don't know if you can see, it's like the yellow mark there, big dribble of linseed oil. So I must have had this sitting under the easel at some point when I was throwing oil around, you know, as you do. I'd probably do. I'm going to wipe it back so there's not too much on there. Basically, I want this because, one, uh, if this was like a third layer on a painting, it would take out any sinking in. But two, and the main reason is everything now is going to be working wet into wet. You know. Hi, Mike. Hi, Diane. Oh, lots of people joining. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. You're very welcome. My old friend John Chew, so good to see you. I've been enjoying your paintings lately from uh, Red Car Beach. If anyone wants to have a look at John's painting, where's the best place for people to find you, John? Uh, Twitter, you post them, don't you? Mostly on Facebook. Don't think you do YouTube, do you? John's been doing some really lovely paintings of our local area that we grew up in well not far not far from where we grew up anyway landscape paintings all right so um let's think about colors so let, actually let me talk a little bit about what i've got out here first i'm going to switch over to um let's switch over to the I'll put the, the palette full screen so you can see what I'm doing here. Light, right? So this is the squash. Imagine the, the, the surface of the squash from light to shadow, okay? Now, I don't usually bother um, doing really involved strings these days. Like, you know, people do color strings to go through all the various modeling factors from light to shadow. It's a really good idea and it does help. But I know that because I've got the squash over here. You know, and I can check the, the local colour of the squash by, it's actually changed a little bit now as it's got older, it's got a bit more green, but I can put a chip against it to check the local colour like that. Um, so in terms of the values, you know, this is a really, really useful thing to get hold of. It's the Paul Cantore Monsell value scale, and I've got thalo green on mine, which isn't a great thing to happen. Um, so this is the Munsell value scale. I know a lot of people are used to value scales that have uh, uh, white as one and, and black as 10 or something. This goes the other way around. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference, actually. But these are, the thing about the Munsell value scale is it's perceptually, these are perceptually even divisions. So it's quite a handy scale. And this one is particularly good because it's laminated, only costs $10 off eBay, and you can actually mix colors and put paint on them, on the, the little squares of value to check that you're hitting the right value. So it's, it's a pretty nice one. Most of you know this, right? I'm preaching to the choir. So light and shadow. So across the light, I wanna have some colors. These are all the same hue. Um, going down in value. So that's nine to seven. I probably want to go down to six and maybe as much as five. Let's get the five out as well. So I'll show you where these ones came from, these chips came from. 
page from the big Munsell color book. These are all the same hue. 7.5 YR. YR just means yellow red, right? Let's get five out. And the reason I've got, so that's five, seven, won't need that one, nine. The reason I've got um, two chips is one is lower chroma and one is higher chroma. You can see that hopefully. One is closer to gray and one is slightly further away from gray. But everything in this painting is really, really low chroma, right? Meaning that everything is, there's no really intense color in this subject. It's all really close to gray. But you can still make something look really beautiful with very subtle color, I think. So I've got three values here in terms of the value scale. So this is my lights area. So I've got a value nine, a value seven, and a value five. Goes down to halfway down the scale. This is my shadows area. And these are value three, like down here, look. Value three. Light, value nine. I'm going down the scale to value seven. Value five. The main thing is value. I mean, if you can nail the values, you know, you will create form. You can get away with murder with the color if the values are really good. But if you if your values are good and your hue is consistent and your chroma is well controlled, then um, you know you can really create something pretty beautiful. So these is these colors are going to be mixed and then painted opaquely into the lights of the squash. These are for the shadow, so they'll be glazed. I might give myself a bit more freedom with the colors in the shadow. So in, in the background, the lighter part, we're going to be around these colors here. And in the shadows, I'll probably, I'm going to throw together a few colors that are something like this to throw a bit of color in the shadows. Oh, sorry, you can't see that, can you? The background light, shadow colors. I'll probably do a few different shadow colors and just you can mess it about a little bit with that there. So the shadow is all going to be glazed. So if I'm thinking about how I'm going to mix these colors, now I know what the, these colors are because I know them pretty well. But I'm going to put out, I'm going to set out my palette, the, the, the tube paints. I think I'm going to need to reach these colors. And then I promise I'll catch up with the comments. Okay. So this is lead white. This is Rublev Flemish white which has a very nice consistency, slightly yellowish. Then I'm going to have some, I know I'm in the yellow orange area here, so let's put out a bit of yellow ochre, not too high chroma. That's about a value five, so I'll put it in the middle. That's a yellow orange. Um, raw umber. I know I'm going to want this because that's also a yellow orange. It's more towards yellow than orange. Very low value, very low chroma. And uh, black. Very, very useful for dropping the chroma of colors. You know, a lot of people say you shouldn't have black on your palette. You know, I would, I would personally say that Rules like that don't matter at all. And what matters is that you have a good understanding of color and color mixing. And then the specific colors you put out, tube colors are much less important. I'm gonna want to get a bit more chroma down the bottom of the value range. So I'm gonna have, where is it? Um, transparent red oxide I'm looking for. Such an old tube. I'd use tiny amounts of this. I got a huge tube years ago. I've had it so long, I've had to tape it up to stop it leaking. But this, that color is so strong. That tube color is so strong. Pigment is so strong. I only ever use a tiny bit. But that's very, very orange. I'll probably need a little bit of that here and there. But I'm also going to put out, and I usually put this out with it as a companion. This is green gold. It's about the same value. But obviously, it's much more yellow. So with these two, I can get quite high chroma low down the value range and I can swing between orange and green. Let's see, use those in a little while. What else are we going to need? We've got some green in there. So if I put out my 
just the green in the stem. So I'm going to put out some bright yellow lake, which I can mix with the black for a nice green. This green here, green gold, will be too yellow. And I'm going to put out a tiny little bit of thallow green as well, so I can push that green more blue if I want to. Tiny bit. Think I'll need anything else? What do you think? Oh, my colours aren't on the camera. Sorry about that. I'm chatting away, talking about the colours I've got out, and they're not on the camera. Let me rearrange the... It's going to wobble about a bit. It's, it's live, you know. This is how you know it's live. <laughs> oh dear, look at that. Sorry about that, I was chatting away, thinking you could see all the colours I was putting out. I'll go over them again. Okay, she says, Paul, we can't see the board paint. I know, I'm so sorry. So listen, I'll, I'll go through it again. Lead white, bright yellow lake. Yellow ochre, green gold. See, all these they look really dark on the screen. And they are, you know, green gold, transparent red oxide, raw umber, ivory black, and a little bit of tallow green. I think I'm going to need a little bit of red, maybe. Am I going to need red? No, I'm not going to need it. I don't think I'm going to need it. Let's see if we can get to all these colours. We probably can't. No, I'm going to put some red out because I think I know somewhere I'm going to want to use a little bit. And the other thing actually is the cloth. Now the cloth, I happen to know because I painted this cloth so many times. This is quinacridone rose, by the way, for my red. Put very blue red, much better than alizarin, which will turn brown in about 10 minutes. All right, a little bit longer than that, but still. Um, the cloth. Slightly purpley blue, very, very low chroma still, but I want that purpley blue because it's going to really stand out against all those oranges. So I want some, Let's see if I can find it. I've got this big box full of paints. So this is most of which I never use dioxazine purple. This is actually Windsor and Newton. It's Windsor violet, very dark. We'll put him down there. I'm only going to use the tiniest touch of that, probably. Let's move these down so you can see them. Actually, let's go. Should we stay on? Stay on here for now. Stay on the palette for now. Now let's have it all up at once. It's more interesting. Then you can see everything like now you can see like light section of the squash so that's this area here shadow area of the squash that's this area shadow of the background all of this light area of the background over here so these these values should be about right for what's in the painting you know look a bit dark that's pretty much bang on this is another nice thing about these chips is you can actually check your values, you know, against your painting and see that the colours you're mixing are going to be right. So that's about the right value, but it's got quite a lot more chroma, so it looks darker. You can see how much chroma we're going to put in there, but it will be a glaze over a neutral background, a pretty neutral background, so it won't show too much. And this bit is all going to be the cloth that like the purple. And then the only green is going to be here. So I'm going to try and keep this uh, kind of feel you know, so let's start off with, let's put some glazes in the shadows. So this is actually, it's quite a simple job. So this is transparent red oxide and this is um, raw umber. I'm not too bothered about the exact color here. I know I want it to go slightly towards orange. Um, because those shadows will be going slightly towards orange. So this kind of way that I'm going to be mixing and using the colour here is like 
you know, a lot of it is heavily monosyllable based, especially when I'm modeling the form, but the rest of it, you know, and to an extent that too, you can, you know, you don't have to stick to the exact colors that are there. I find as long as you nail the values and chroma is really important too, as long as you do a good job of the, um, as long as you do a good job of the chroma and the values, hue is kind of a little bit more flexible, but it's funny enough, it's the bit that everybody obsesses about. Francis says, what about pyrrole red? No, I would only put that out if I needed a really intense red. Greta says, is there really no substitute for green gold? Honestly, I don't think there really is. Not that far down the value range. Ooh, lots of comments. Oh my word. I'm not going to be able to catch up with all of this. I'm sorry. I'm, going to, I'm just going to steam in and start painting. Um, Diane says, I hope this is recorded. I must watch later. It absolutely is. And Greta says, what colours did you use for the underpainting? Black and white. It's actually mostly raw umber and white. So the low values are raw umber and black with white. And then um, I'm mixing increasing amounts of black as I go up the value scale. Michelle, you've decorated your tree? I... <laughs> I haven't even brought our tree in from outside yet. Alan says, will we always be excluded from buying lead white? Well, we're not now. You know, if you go to supremepaints.co.uk, Alan, you can get lead white there. You can also get it from, oh no. Disaster. I've just got transparent red oxide on my face. Um, you can also get it from Jackson's if you get um, Michael Harding. Uh, what's it called? Kremnitz white, but it's very short. It doesn't it doesn't have much oil in it, so you need to add a bit of oil. Let's get a brush out and do some messing about. So this is like a really this is a high chroma color down this end of the value range. So if I just pick that up and put it on, if I paint it on really thickly, you know, I mean it's it's really that's quite intense, isn't it? You know that the chroma is going to be a little bit too high, but this is how I go about glazing. If I want to knock it back, I can just wipe it off. You have so much control with this method of how, how much chroma and how much depth you add. I mean, most of that is pretty low uh, chroma. So this is just raw umber. So what if I use just raw umber? It's going to be much more subtle. You see, that's a lot more subtle. Um, but I'm putting it on very thinly. You know, and then I can wipe that back. So that all I'm trying to do is 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 just kind of um, give an impression of color here and and allow it to uh, allow it the brush strokes underneath to show through still. I'm dropping the value a little bit there. I don't mind dropping it a little bit here. But I mean that's like you know a very small amount of painting for 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 quite you know. For quite a good result it's like suddenly the painting is, starts to have a little bit of depth let's take this all the way around to here and suddenly the shadow comes to life i mean it's that easy if the values are right you know so let's uh, i want to mix some of the light color for the background here which i would paint more opaquely So that means a little bit of mixing, right? So I want to be somewhere around here. Um, let's get some white. Get these out of the way for now. I generally like to do backgrounds first. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't think it's a good idea to see this as a thing and this is the background behind it. You really want to see the whole thing in patterns of light and dark as much as you can. And I think the language that we use sometimes when we're talking about painting actually makes it more difficult to paint because you think right now I've painted that thing and now I've got to paint this thing and then I'll paint that thing. Um, but this area, you know, I like to get this done first because um, it allows me to then paint a hard edge here over it. You see how I've let this glaze go over this edge a little bit and I can paint a hard opaque edge over it and it will appear visually to be in front of that, which I do want, you know, I do want some depth. So let's put a tiny bit of red in there. I mean, that's just like the smallest amount. 
some raw umber, a little bit of black. I want this to be low chroma. Let's see what we get. We'll go down the value range a little bit from there. Uh, a bit more raw umber, a bit more black. The reason I'm putting the black in is because I want this to be very low chroma because what happens a lot, overshot look, overshot the value. What happens a lot in um, low chroma colors, by which I mean colors close to gray, the way they behave in light and shadow is that in the shadow, they will be lower chroma. And generally you could say cooler colors, you know, as in the, the chroma will be lower, which generally makes them appear, you could say cooler. You could use that word if you were so inclined. I'm generally not, but you know, <laughs> to, each, to each her own. Um, and also in the shadows, you will have higher chroma and the colors will generally go slightly towards orange. They will be slightly warmer. So this is actually, the background is very neutral anyway, really close to neutral, okay? I want a little bit more chroma than that. I'm just adding tiny amounts of this, of this um, quinacridone rose, because I want it to go a little bit red. It's mostly because I know the, uh, the board that I, I put in the, behind the squash in this still life set up very well, because I painted it a lot of times. Oh, the value is pretty nice. Yeah, the value is all right. Um, let's get uh, another colour of about the same value. So this is just raw umber. I'll put some black in it to drop the chroma a bit. So I want this about the same value. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting a couple of colours together that are slightly different hue, similar chroma and similar value. They don't have to be exact, you know, as long as they're close. And let's get a true, like a, a true and neutral as well to be able to play with. So that would be white, a little bit of raw umber and some ivory black, something much closer to a true neutral. But the key here is making sure that they're all the same value. And I mean, for me personally, I do this a lot. So it's just like anything. You like the more you practice something, the, the quicker and the better you get at it. Um, but when you're kind of figuring out this kind of stuff about color, it's a really good idea to check the values, just check the value. And I want like about a value five-ish, you know, so that's good. I can check that one. Is that about a value five? Yeah, it is. And that one too. But they're all, <clears throat> all the same value, but slightly different. So I'm going to get a fresh brush and, um, Please get some oil on it to work it in. <laughs> Suzanne says you're saying cooler. I know I did. I did. The thing is, what bothers me about using temperature, that, that Todd Casey, really good painter and also um, uh, lovely, lovely man as well. And he's just brought out a really good book. He's done two really good books, one on still life and one on colour. And the one on colour, he makes the point early on that... Um, we tend to use interchangeable vocabulary from light and from pigment when we talk about colour in painting, Bec probably because we deal with both. When you're looking at your subject, it's light that makes it live, that brings it to life, that allows you to see it. And we do talk about light in terms of temperature. That is correct. Kelvins. So a light can be warmer or it can be cooler. But a pigment really can't. Not really. I mean, mostly we, we, when people are talking about warm and cool, they're talking about um, hue. But actually, if you take like a, if you take a really low chroma orange and you put it against a high chroma orange, the lower chroma orange will look cooler. You know, and that has nothing to do with hue. So, and, and a lot of the time, I mean, that's a practical thing as well, because a lot of the time when painters are, are, are uh, like portrait painters, turning flesh, you know, turning form of flesh, they could be, um,
changing the chroma more than anything else and it will look cooler and then if you try and do what they're doing by adding blue you're going to end up with a really different result you know it's not really going to work soft edge Keep the soft edge so you see how this being like a lot lower chroma than than the shadow and going up as well at the same time in uh, in value makes it appear that there's light on there i'd rather have a little bit more variation on there actually because it's all i've got the values too close if anything and i think it's all a little bit too similar so let's I don't like it when, it when the painting has no life, when you, you can't see the brush strokes, you know. So this is just a soft brush with no paint on it. So this shadow here also is going to be, um, it's going to have a little bit of chroma in it. So let's just go in, like right under here, I'm going to go in with raw umber. It's intensifying the value a little bit at the same time. Need a lighter version of that color coming out of the shadow, but we still have a little bit of chroma in it. And then let's have a look at the cloth. So I want to be slightly purple. I was talking about for that. I'm saving this bit of the palette here where I'm going to do my my colours for my um for my squash. Steve, thanks very much for popping those in. Yeah, they're great. Katie says, do you ever use a colour checker? Oh yes. I use oh I've lost it. Here it is. This highly technical piece of equipment. It's basically a bit of paper with a hole, hole cut in it. Um, really handy. And it's handy if you've got Monso chips as well, because you can check the color of things, you know, like this. You can hold up the chip against the, um, the subject, obviously not the painting, and, um, and check the hue and the chroma. It's less useful for value. I think you need to understand value separately, mainly because the range of values in nature that we see are uh, so much wider than the range of values that, that we can get with paint. People have a, a mistaken idea that in still life, when you're painting indoors, you can hit most of the values. You really can't, you really can't. Not if you've got a, 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 a light local and a dark local in this subject. So this is I'm, why I'm gonna put in a tiny bit of this purple. Too much. I don't want it to be actually purple. I just want to send it that, that direction a little bit, tiny bit of, make it a little bit more red. So that's quinacridone rose and in purple. And then I'm going to bring it down with black. A little bit of black. Now value wise, I think I probably want to be about a value eight for most of the cloth. So that's probably about a six. So now I've got that color together. It's low chroma, but it's, you know, it, it's like you feel that difference in hue more than you see it. Clean that up a little bit. Let's do a lighter version, a bit more white. Um, this is a cooler colors, and I, uh, by which I mean hue in hue terms, um, I'm more towards blues and blue purples. In, in lighter values, they are easier to mix with um, titanium white. Lead white is a little bit a little bit more orange yellow um, and uh, this Flemish white by Rublev is gorgeous but it is very it tends even more towards yellow so that's probably about six or seven but I love the consistency of it it's very creamy and smooth that's going to be up to about an eight Get a fresh brush out for this. I'm going to chuck this on dry. Let's see value-wise where we are. Yeah, 
we're about right. I think it could probably be a bit lower. I think that the, this has got a little bit too light actually. So this is like an, an exercise in, in subtlety, if you like, this piece, because all of the colors are really, really low chroma. There's nothing that really sings out. So this one that I did recently, mostly low colors, except for the rose, you know, which is very, very high chroma in, in places. But the, the, the shadows have a similar kind of a, a feel to them, you know. Linda says, are you dipping your brush into linseed or another medium? I only ever use linseed oil. I don't use anything else. Um, I like to just keep... Um... Hello, Rupture. Thank you. <laughs> I like to keep the number of ingredients in my paintings as limited as possible because um, there's less chance for things to go wrong, frankly. Mm, we could actually probably go a little bit darker than that in places. Bring in a little bit of black. As I go down the value range here, a bit of raw umber, I'm getting towards shadow, so I'm allowing it to swing towards orange from this purple a little bit. Soft edges everywhere I can. Um, this, as it comes out into the light, will start going a little bit towards the. So, uh, you know, this is, I think this is, this is, so far it's pretty subtle and the squash will be pretty subtle as well, but already it's starting to have a little bit more depth and life. Would you agree? Just by, you know, these very subtle colors. And this is one of the, I think it's a really important thing to learn in painting is that really low chroma color um, can be really beautiful, you know, and it can be um, very effective. A lot of the time, people tend to dive into high chroma too quickly and, um, and it can really kind of it can destroy the, the feeling of, of light. Now, personally, I'm a really big fan of, of low chroma anyway. All right. So I've got orangish and yellows in here. I've got some purpley reds, very low chroma up here, up to neutral. I've got very low chroma purple around here. It would be nice to be able to switch from this version back to the, the black and white one, wouldn't it really? What kind of brush are you using? Frantis, these are mostly, Frantis, sorry, these are mostly hog brushes from Cornelison that I'm using here. Pan says, would you explain how to use that paper with a little square, please? I didn't get it. Yeah, absolutely. So say you've got um, something like this. I might have to mess with the lights. Yeah, so I've got lights. I've got a light this side and I've got a light this side. So I have um, a well-lit easel for you, for the cameras. But if I knock one of these lights off, now I'm gonna have light and shadow on this, right? So <clears throat> I can hold this up. And if I hold it at the same uh, angle as my picture plane, i.e. as my painting, imagine that this is sitting on a, on a you know, still life stand then I can isolate the colors. I mean, you can call it a color checker, you can call it an isolator. So I can see the values change across the surface from light to shadow. See how low the value is there in the shadows compared to the lights. So if I use that with the value scale, <clears throat> it will help me get some impression, but this will be an interesting little thing to show you, I think probably. So. What I've got here against the hole is the highest value you can get in paint, pretty much, which is about a value nine, right? 
So if I angle this so that, that it's about the same value, which is about there, right? So if I hold it at that value and then at that angle, and then I get pretty much the lowest, which is about a value one, it's, that's right down where the shadow is. You know, it's right down where the shadow values are. Now that's all right if I've only got this to paint, but what if I also had something that was black to paint? And you can see there that the shadow side of that cube is a lower value than the shadow side of the squash, right? There's a difference in value there. I can't hit that full range in paint. The squash and the cube together, I can't hit that full range in paint. This, because our paintings are flat, right? So I can angle this this way, and then that will make all these values look darker, and then I can match the darkest value, but then I can't match the lightest value. Because look, you know, that's the lightest value I can get in paint. If I angle it away, then obviously it's, I've got to angle it around here so I can get that value, but then I can't get the value of the shadow side of a dark object in paint. I can't do it can't get the full range. So you have to compromise. You have to compromise. And that's why the study of value is so fascinating and a little bit tricky. A little bit tricky sometimes. Let's mix up some color for the squash, right? So um, these are all the same hue, as I was saying. It's like a, it's like a yellow, yellow orange. Uh, need more white. I tend to use a lot of paint these days, <laughs> and I always throw some away. You know, I would rather be mixing uh, more paint than I use than to be stuck trying to remix like more paint as I go along because I didn't mix enough of a particular color because, you know, I like to have the colors mixed before I start painting with them. Well, there's no other way to do it. You can't paint with a color you haven't mixed, can you? But you know what I mean? And then you're freer when you're actually painting, to think about everything else that you need to be thinking about, to think about the, the expression, the brush strokes, the way you apply the paint, all that kind of stuff. The stuff that makes painting beautiful, you know. So let's whack these together quickly. I'm not gonna to be too perfect, but I'll see how close I can get. So I want, this is like value nine. So this is right near the top of the scale. I, I want it to go slightly yellow yellow orange so i've got a little bit of yellow ochre in there and i put in a little bit of transparent red oxide to send it a little bit more orange but i mean tiny amounts because what i'm doing to get a value nine i'm basically just tinting white so i'm after something like this color here tiny tiny amounts and as long as the hue is pretty close if you nail the values and um, the chromas you know you'd be fine you don't um, have to use Munsell to do this, but it's just much quicker to learn some of the basics of, of color, I think anyway, um, by using it. All right, that's, that probably do. A uh, little bit more yellow. So next one down. RGH, someone mentioned RGH. Hello, Julie, nice to see you. Is this an eight by 10? Yes, it is, it is an eight by 10. Oh, RGH, right. Uh, yeah, I, I hear that's really good paint, but I, I've never used it. It's funny, every time it comes up on a live stream, I think, I've got to get myself some, let me turn this back on. The other light. I've got to get myself some of that paint and see what it's like. A good friend of mine, Richard Murdoch, swears by it. And he knows what he's about. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to bring this down to the value that I want with raw umber because raw umber is a yellow orange. More towards the yellow though, so I'll probably need to make it a little more orange. So this is what I'm after, like a value seven here. So uh, people do paint with um, more involved kind of 
strings you know from light to shadow with smaller steps but personally I mean for me like I just think well I can mix between these two so I'm not really that bothered um, so that's too yellow and it's very low chroma so I'm going to add in a tiny amount of transparent red oxide which is going to add some chroma and send it more orange I don't want to add too much because this is such a strong pigment and if it goes too orange I can push it back towards yellow if I want with the green gold but I'm after really low chroma so I don't think I'll need to here and the reason I've got a lower chroma and a slightly higher chroma one is so that I can try it um, whilst I'm painting and you would get to see me try it I'm going to put a little bit of yellow ochre in because I'm not really getting enough chroma in the yellow um, I'm going to try you know adding a little bit more chroma than is actually there you know just to intensify it a little bit and see what happens It's all right, the chroma is good and the value is good, but it's a little bit too yellow. So I'm going to put a tiny touch of quinacridone rose in it just to send it a bit more red. I could also use, I mean, anything reddish will do. I could use the um, transparent red oxide as well. Now ah, that'll do. Next value down. Now I want a higher chroma version of that. I'm going to do mostly with yellow ochre and transparent red oxide without the raw umber to start with, and that's going to get me much higher chroma, too high, right? The value is the value is too low as well. So I can bring that back down with some raw umber which will also bring the value down. It's always a bit of kind of give and take when you're mixing. Mm, it's close enough. Can you see that? So I've got a lower and a higher chrome on. I know the palette is a little bit small on the screen, so it depends how big your screen is, how easily you can see it. Mixing lighter colors, you, you've just got to be really careful like what you put in, <laughs> how much you put in. So I'm going down the value range again. Next level down. This is down to value five. So I'm going to get to about the right value first with raw umber. I'll do the low chroma one first. Doesn't really matter which way around. And then I'll, once I've hit the value, this is a really good approach to color mixing, by the way, is to pick a couple of colors that you think are going to get you close, like usually white and something, or if it's high chroma, maybe yellow or orange and something. Um, and then get it to the right value first. And then once you're at the right value, think, well, what needs to happen to it now? So that's a bit dark. So that's just raw umber and white about the right value now but it's too yellow and it's too low chroma so I want the chroma to go up and I want it to go slightly more orange so adding a little bit of transparent red oxide mixed with white which I've run out of again is going to do that the reason I'm going to mix it with white is so that I can bring it up to the same value before I mix it in so it doesn't do anything funny with the value so that's like quite a high chroma so let's mix that in Still a little bit too orangey yellow. It is fine now. That's my neck middle value, so that's like value five. That's like going to be like the half tone just before we hit the shadow. Probably a little bit on the dark side, but I can mix up. We do a higher chroma one just in case I want to play with that. Again, I'm going to use mostly. Transparent red oxide is going to be too red, so I'll put a little bit of yellow ochre in with it. I am going to bring some raw umber in because I've got to bring the value down a long way. So 
So this is, I mean, for modeling form carefully, this is a really good approach. You know, put together careful strings like this. And once you've got them mixed, you just, you, you're, you're much less likely to make any wild mistakes. The, is there a downside to this approach? Possibly, right? I think maybe because it also, at the same time as me making sure that you get really accurate color, that might not always be what you want. And it might actually take some expression out of it. You know, so there are other approaches, obviously, to color. And that my feeling is that um, you will, you know, you should learn, learn, um, learn to see color accurately first and then go with what feels right to you. You know, fi find a teacher who teaches color, who, who, whose color you like. The, the problem is with a lot of artists who teach, hopefully this isn't too controversial a thing to say, is that they evolve very personal approaches to color through untold hours of practice, which are then difficult to, they're difficult to get across to other people, you know. And they're often not realistic and they're very personal. And that's something that I think you kind of need to evolve over time. But if you want to paint something that looks realistic and you want to understand how color moves from light to shadow, then this is a good approach. Uh, so the shadow side. We've got to go right down to value three now. I'm going to bring a little bit of the green in because I'll be putting in quite a fair bit of the transparent red oxide and I don't want it to go too orange. Now the green is going to keep the chroma, but it's going to stop it from going too orange. Might be too high chroma that, we'll see. Because we, it's a low chroma object that the, um, the local color, you know, the, the color it is, is very low chroma. Um, it's likely that uh, the shadow is going to be, the shadow side is going to be slightly higher chroma than the light. So that's a lot of messing about, right? That's a lot of mixing. It takes a bit of time. Um, but those colors are going to be pretty accurate. So then when I come to putting them on the painting, I, all I've got really to think about is, um, is how I'm going to apply it, you know, how I want this thing to look. <laughs> That's funny. Someone says, I hate wasting paint, and it means I'm constantly trying to remix colors as I never make enough. <laughs> you know, I, I tell you, it's not just about um, having to remix. That's not the only problem that you, that you get uh, by not mixing enough paint. The other thing that can happen a lot, I mean, this is a bit of a bugbear of mine because I teach quite a lot, you know, and I'm always trying to get people to mix more paint because if you don't mix enough, you'll get, when you start running out, the paint will end up thin. And you'll get into that kind of fussing and trying to spread the paint out and get it to go further. And, and you think, oh, I don't want to have to remix it. I'll just try and spread it out a bit and see if I... And then you end up with a lot of the most beautiful effects that you can get with oil paint, especially soft edges like this. You cannot get with really, really thin paint, you know. <laughs> I don't think I... Did I say half an hour? I'm pretty sure I said an hour. Because then, then I realized that I was going to do some color mixing and I'd probably be on for an hour. Surely. <laughs> Let's do the shadow side first. Bit of oil, just linseed oil. So let's see. So this is like the core shadow color. So this would be the darker areas here. Um, I'm going to make sure that I still don't have a, any kind of an edge here. You know, so I can take those two colors that I'm using in the background. And I can just kind of, um, there's the darker one, squidge this area between them so I don't end up with a, a, you know, I don't want an edge here. And instantly, look at that. I mean, it's just a few strokes and instantly, you know, it starts to make a difference. Down here, there'll be some of that core shadow color as well, where the form is turning out of um, the cast shadow there, the occlusion shadow. 
But over here we've got reflected light, right? Well, let's paint this, this in as, as pretty much a shape, core shadow shape. You know what, just to make it more obvious, I'm going to paint all of this the core shadow. This is all, just to show you a bit more clearly what I'm doing. This is all core shadow, right? Now, and then I'm going to paint the reflected light into it. So the reflected light that comes into this here is reflecting off this slightly purple cloth and up into the shadow. So, <clears throat> you know, this is the purple that I was using. The, what, what people often get wrong with the reflected light is they let the value go too high. The value is actually going to be pretty low. Um, so the chroma is going to drop. I'm actually taking some of the color that I used for the darker parts of the cloth here, and I'm mixing a little bit of that with the color that I used for the shadow. Not enough. Reflected light. It's not all that obvious, you know, it's so easy to overdo. And you've got to think about the planes, like this edge of this plane here is coming down. The light is reflecting up into it. I'm going to bring that out a little bit more. Just bring it just a little bit more at the bottom here. Because obviously this bit is going to be the lightest part of the reflected light because it's closest to where it's bouncing off the cloth, right? So a um, little bit of the local colour, a little bit of the colour of the cloth. And that kind of melds into, I'm going to get a fresh brush for this, the half tone. Where the form is just starting to come out of the shadow and turning into the light. Didn't bring that shadow up enough. Should be core cool shadow too. Bit of a mistake actually in the original painting and the drawing. So I've pushed the chroma slightly higher than it really is, you know. <clears throat> and then gradually we go up the value range as we come out into the light and the chroma drops. So I'm up, I know that I'm up about value seven and I know the lightest bits are the lightest values that I can get in paint. So they're like a, a, a nine. You know, so the values are not just for mixing, they're about thinking about the planes as well and, and you know, what angle something is to the light and therefore what, uh, what value it's going to be, you know. We'll refine some of the drawing a little bit here and there where I think it needs it. This area slightly turns away from the light, so a little bit darker value. The shadow of the thing there. The thing is another word for the stalk, stem, whatever you call it. So I just want to get the right colours in the right place to start off with. Um, and then once I'm pretty happy with those, I'm going to destroy it. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, you'll see. But you know, it's starting to have a little bit more um, kind of life now, you know. So this is the value nine. So this is opaque. I'm not glazing now. This is like thick paint I'm putting on here. And you can almost feel like, I want this hard edge there, I'm going to keep that. You can almost feel the uh, 
the physicality of the paint, you know. It doesn't come across quite so well on a screen as it does in real life. Um, it does come across, but in, in real life, you could, it's much more obvious. So no blending or anything, I'm just putting the colors in. Can mix between them if I want to. So this is a value uh, seven and this is a nine. So if I want something between them, I just can mix between them. Most of this is dark. Turning away from the light. Darker here. So I'm just trying to think in simplified planes, you know, and putting the right value in where I think I'm going to, I'm going to need that. Turn away from the light a little bit there. So I'm trying to think about the shapes of the light and the shadow areas. I'm not trying to think about painting the actual thing. Really you don't want to get involved in that at this stage. So I promised I was going to destroy it. <clears throat> this is a big, this is a dry brush. It's very, very soft, beautiful. It's a watercolor wash brush actually. Um, I want to make sure that the paint is all in the right place before I do this though. Because there's no blending or anything, you know, these are all pretty hard edged. It's all hard edged at the moment, you know. <laughs> I, love, I love doing this stage. Just destroy it all. And then we can work back into it and start refining it where we want to. When I, when I say destroy it, I mean, I mean the hard, take out all of the hard edges, you know. Just make everything really soft and it gives it this kind of, almost like a, a glow and then a pop in in some areas and make an edge hard. Where I feel it needs it. I want a very light value down here to show this plane change. This down, more light. So the, the challenge at this stage is to keep the simplicity of the division. Okay. I need more reflected light down here because I haven't got enough. So I'll bring some in there. Um, where's a good brush? Bring out another one. This is all reflected light. So it's within the shadow area. But it's, there's a lot of reflected light there. I'm going to push this higher because it's reflecting off the very light surface. As long as I make sure that I don't reach this value, then it will, it will be okay. If I, if I reach that value, then I'm in trouble because this is light reflecting up, so it can't get to the same value, right? Because it's already bounced off something. So I'm still going between the actual colors that I've mixed for the squash and the color, slightly influenced by the color of the cloth. Work this up and then make sure that I leave those core shadow colors where they need to be. And as we move further away from the cloth, the value of the reflected light will drop a little bit. I 
it's starting to come, it's starting to appear. Reflected light is a really important part of the modeling factors, but it's so often overdone. This is, see, this is all reflected light here. You need to be very clear about like the half tone here, it's the same, almost the same value, pretty much the same value as the reflected light around here, but you need to be very clear in your mind about whether you're painting a half tone or whether you're painting reflected light so that you make sure that you keep the form consistent. You know, if you get confused, you think, well, that's just darker and that's lighter. It's, it's not really. It's more than that. It needs a bit more thinking about than that, I, I think. If you want it to work, you know. And I'm also being careful not to just do lots of brush strokes that follow the form. No, I don't want to just follow the form with the brush strokes because that also will destroy the form. It doesn't really look like that. So I'm putting in lots of little scumbly dabs and stuff like that to kind of make the, make this turn. And there's going to be some, a couple of, I'm going to get a fresh brush for this, a smaller one. It's going to be a couple of bright light like actually white highlights where the light is reflecting directly back off the surface. And he's starting to appear. I want all these areas to be soft. But I want this, I want this, uh, I want to keep this hard edge here. You know, I can really bring that out with the shadow color. Kind of feel like maybe you're going to want a harder edge there too. So now I can think about, you know, where do I want a hard edge? Where do I want? At the moment, all the edges are pretty, pretty soft. So I can just think about, well, where would be good to have a hard edge? And usually the, def the default is if there's a light shape against a shadow and it's in front of it, then that's a pretty a good bet for a, for a harder edge, you know. But I want this to still be disappearing into nothingness here. Because if I squint down and I look at the reference photo, I can't really see it. And that's my kind of, um, my guide a lot of the time for whether I'm going to go for a harder or a softer edge. Hard. Or really, really low chroma. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's beginning to, it's beginning to, to have some life. I'm going to try and bring down the value a little bit of the core shadow just in a couple of areas. I think this is too light. Let's just squidge across all of that. <laughs> nice. So I've pushed the chroma a little bit in places. I've added a little bit of color, not very much. It's still very low chroma, but I've added a little bit here and there. Um, <clears throat> in order to Make it just to make a nicer painting. You know, so my, my squash here is, is softer than the one in the photo. It's got brush strokes all over it. And it's also, um, you know, to me, it has like a little bit more expression. Now here is an interesting part, right? Because if I just paint across this edge and lose that edge completely, it seems to give the thing just that little bit more life. This is too clear. We'll soften this a little bit into nothing there. So these are all the little bits, you know. But what I've got to be really careful of here is that I don't lose the overall feeling, if, I, if I'm, I lose that, you know, the overall division between the light and the shadow, if I begin to lose that, then I'm in serious trouble. 
and I no longer have a painting that, that really works, that looks good. And that's the problem when you work too much on something um, because there's a mistake there, but you can't really see what it is. It can really run away from you really quickly. I want some, I want the green. Let's whiz up on the green of the stem. So if I just grab some, I'm going to whiz this up quick, some ivory black, a little bit of this bright yellow lake, which is an aralide yellow. It's like Hansa yellow. It's a very green yellow. No. Mm. Shadow side. Seeing odd little bits that I need to change a little as I'm painting. The light side of that is going to be much lower chroma, um, more towards grey because it's going into the light. And it's all, also not as high value as you think, so I'm going to try going in with about a value 5 for the light side. Seems about right. You've got the shadow of the stem. So I, uh, hopefully it's obvious, that, you know, that I've taken a few liberties with the color. Like I've pushed the chroma a little bit beyond what it is in the, uh, in the reference photo, you know. Um, but uh, personally, I'm all right with that. I feel it has a little bit more presence and life. And if you could see it close up, like in the shadows, especially, I brought in quite a bit of, quite a bit more chroma. Uh, let's bring this up a little bit further. I'm going to bring some, look, see, I can put a lot of different stuff like this is, if I pick up some of the green gold, you know, I can put that into the shadow and it's going to work. And it's bringing up a lot of chroma. I could put some, uh, let's go a bit mad, you know, I'll put some, transparent red oxide and a little bit of quinacridone rose in there. You know, that's almost like impressionism. That's like, a, it's not all that obvious, but it's, it's quite a high chroma red, you know. Shadows have to be soft to blend it all in. Um, and it's making a painting that has a lot more going on in it. You know, you don't have to do this. I'm just showing you as an example. Like, as long as you, you pretty much nail the main parts of the painting, you can, you can play a little bit with the colour if you want to. I think it's really good to understand how colour works and to be able to do accurate colour, um, because then you can play with it a little bit. You, you kind of know where you can, you can change things a little bit if you want to and, and add some stuff. Give the thing a little bit more life. So I don't often do this. Sometimes I do. I just wanted to kind of demonstrate that that's a thing that you can do if you wanted to. Or you can paint with really, really accurate colour and both can make beautiful paintings. I don't think it's an either or. Slightly lighter here just last little bits really now just to try and give it a little bit more life where it needs it thank you susan pat says amazing do you paint with pastels too funny you should ask that i don't but i used to i used to do street art and i used to do um like years and years and years ago that's how i survived when i was young and um having a difficult life 
and uh, I used to go and paint, uh, do, do master copies in pastels on the streets, mostly in York, in the north, and then some Midlands towns. And um, it was nice, actually, you know, just put a hat out and uh, give you money if they liked your work. I got to a point where I could do the Mona Lisa by heart. I've done it so many times I didn't need the I didn't need the the photo anymore. I could just I could literally sit down and do the Mona Lisa without any reference at all. Mad, huh? Um I did a lot of Da Vinci, I did a lot of um Tiepolo paintings, actually Tiepolo ceiling paintings, which were great to do nice um Baroque, very actually more Rococo, I suppose, very flowing paintings. People loved those. I'm not that great a fan of Tiepolo myself, but his composition and his colour is amazing. All right, so you saw everything that I used here, right? There's, there's nothing um, really out of the ordinary here. You know, I'm, I'm just dealing with, um, you know, the same pigments that we all use and, and uh, just an understanding of chroma and, and light. Uh, glazed over a very soft value underpainting. Maybe a little bit darker under there. Pushing things a little bit here and there and making a painting <clears throat> rather than something which is just like looks exactly like the reference photo, you know, because the reference photo in any case is like it. It's, it's a version of an image, but it's not necessarily the one that I want to make, you know. I think I need a little bit more light shape back here. And there comes a point when you can do this well, where it feels, a little bit almost like you're, you're painting with light. Once you can, you know, and it's not, it's not rocket science to be able to do this, but once you can create like strong form this way, you know, I know that this shape needs to come back out into the light a little more so I can just paint it in and it will, it will happen, you know, because I know that I'm, I'm confident in the colors that I'm using, that they're uh, consistent. What do you think? Can you see that, that, that what I've got here is a, is a slightly edited version? It's obviously closely related to the reference, but it's, uh, and I'm trying to make something with a little bit more expression. And for me, this is the difference between painting and and um, photography, not saying that photography can't be expressive. I'm talking about the difference between what I'm doing here and the reference photo that I took. And even though this is all this pretty much the same value, you can see, you can feel the difference. So you could say this is cool and this is warm. I would prefer to say because the chroma is almost the same between the two. This is slightly higher chroma and uh, in, hue, in terms of hue, it's slightly uh, towards orange yellow. So yeah, I mean, you could say that's warm. And this is like a purple. The cloth is like a purple blue. So you could say, yeah. But the, di the difference is in, in hue there. Sometimes the difference is, is more chroma. I'm just enjoying myself now, just making little edits and changing things here and there, and, you know, thinking what I might want to do. This is, the, for me, this is the fun part of painting. When you're not panicked anymore, you know you've got an image that actually looks like something exists there. <laughs> you can afford to play a little bit and see, see what comes out.
David says, if you mix a load of paint on a tray or palette and then put it in a bath of water, it stays fresh. Mm -hmm. I, personally, I like to, to, uh, I like to paint with like fresh paint every time because I, I, I worry that the paint will start to cure and it won't. See, a lot of this kind of way of painting is dependent on the paint behaving and being very loose. You know, being able to slide the paint around and blend it, you know, and if you can't do that, then it's, it's kind of difficult. So at the moment, I'm trying to soften all of the shadow area to make sure that I only have texture. So a lot of the texture that I've made here, I've done by getting some paint and then not actually even painting, just like rolling the brush. I don't want this to be perfect. I want it, I want it to, to have texture in life, you know. You can roll it on. If I painted this all with strokes that went round like this, it would look a lot less convincing. But if I kind of roll it on, then it's got like a texture to it. It's got life, it's got dither, it's, it's something physical that you can touch. Whereas in the shadows, I want soft. So this is, um, someone was saying earlier on how to get soft edges. Once you put the paint down, if you're painting into an oil layer like I am here, then you get a soft brush, synthetic. Flats are good, like these. This is um, Winsor & Newton Scepter Gold. No, no um, paint on it, but it's, it's clean. Dry, very light pressure and just drag. And you can get incredible softness with oil paint that way. Incredible softness. That's how to create soft edges. <laughs> Simon, that's a very nice thing to say. I actually am a fan of Wes Montgomery as well. I used to play jazz guitar. Paz says, do you paint portraits? Now, that's a good question because, no, I haven't for a long time. But in about two weeks, I'm doing a workshop with um, Anastasia Pollard, who is a brilliant portrait painter. And uh, I can't wait. So I'm going to, so I, want to, I do want to start doing more portrait work. So I'm going to someone who, who basically specializes in it to learn from her um, some stuff about portrait painting. Really looking forward to that. I actually can't wait. I mean, I, I haven't done a workshop just for myself. I've taught, I teach a lot of workshops now, but I haven't done one just for myself. I don't know how long, for years and years and years. So that's going to be like a really lovely just to be able to just paint, you know, let someone else worry about all of the, the organization and everything and just do just the best job I can of some painting. I, I'm absolutely just can't wait to start. So I think, I think we're pretty much there with this one. I think I'm pretty happy with how that one's come out, I think. It's certainly not. I think you can see those little flecks of colour in the shadow. I don't often do that, but I do sometimes. Um, and if you know where you can get away with that, and you can put it in, you know, it's. I th personally, I think it's a really nice effect. It's not accurate colour. It is an interpretation. But I think it works really nicely. And it certainly doesn't destroy the depth. If anything, it gives it a little bit more depth. You could say it's kind of a, like a halfway house between um, very, let's say, exacting painting and um, of painting of form and uh, almost a, like a kind of impressionism. And also I have pushed the chroma a little bit here and there. There are two ways about that. So if I put, you see how I put that on and it's a little bit too, you know, it's too hard edged, it doesn't work. So I can get my synthetic out and, and just blend it in, pull the paint around, soften those edges, and then it will integrate itself into the, into the paint layer much more nicely and softly and will work much better. Is that blending brush rabbit hair? No, actually, it's mostly their synthetics, just synthetics, you know. Hello, Mary. I'm sorry I missed you joining. Oh, I'm so behind on the chat. I'm sorry. 
I'll try and catch up. Um, <clears throat> you were epic. That's a very nice thing to say. Honestly, this is all learnable, you know. This is all learnable. And on that note, I am actually about to start. Well, it's in about in a week and a half. I'm, I'm giving a, a workshop. Online workshops so is basically the same kind of thing as I'm doing here, like live streams. Um, teaching this stuff, like how to paint with all soft edges to begin with the big picture and uh, making sure that you concentrate on the light and shadow shape so you don't lose the form. And then um, modeling form from light to shadow. Very exactly. Uh, it's all learnable. It's absolutely learnable, this stuff. It's not. There's no rocket science involved. Yes, it takes practice. It does take practice and it takes work. Um, but I just actually taught a workshop that the original uh, value. See, that's too hard now. I don't like that hard edge there. It's just got too hard. The original value study that I just painted over came from, it was a demonstration from that workshop. That's better. Let's just, let's just take some of this hardness off. So I, I just want it here, you know. I can even drag some of this across and soften this too. Um, <clears throat> and now this looks too hard. I think I, uh, I've actually got, um, I mean, it's basically this. I mean, what I've just demonstrated for six weeks, six live sessions. I've got, um, I wonder if I can play this. I've got, a, to explain it more, I've actually got um, Rembrandtish texture in the light. What a lovely thing to say, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. Um, I've got a little video. Let's see if I can play it, which will tell you. It's only a couple of minutes. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to stick this video on, which is about the workshop that I've got starting soon. Uh, let me actually, before I do, I'll pop a link into the, um, into the comments so that you can find out a bit. Or maybe I'll just put the link in actually because... Um, then you can just go and have a look at it yourself if you if you think you might be interested. So it's a, it's like a six it's a six week workshop. Online sessions like this, basically teaching this stuff um, with different uh, reference material. Um, this approach, if you like, to creating paintings. Um, Where's the, I'm just looking for the comments, so I can, yeah, so if you pop over, have a look at this link here, if you want to. And that will tell you a little bit about the, about the workshop. Let's see if I can play this video. And then it, have a think about while I'm playing this, it's only a couple of minutes. If you've got any questions about any of this, um, what I was doing, if, if I went over any of it too quickly and you, and you didn't get it quickly enough, then, um, then I'll pop back just to say goodbye after this video. And then you can, this is pre-recorded, you know, you can ask me then. What are the main problems that I find myself repeatedly critiquing when I'm teaching and I'm looking at people's work, okay? Edges. Too many hard edges and no soft edges. It makes everything look flat. Getting lost in detail too soon, which leads to overworking, firstly, and also losing uh, the big picture, the, the pattern of lights and shadows and the value relationships that make a strong picture. The next one, I have to say this is a weak composition. Just not enough thought given at the start to the arrangement of the patterns of light and shadow to create the image. You've heard all of this advice before, I know. Well, I've put together um, a method, a process, if you like, over the last couple of workshops that I've taught for rooting around these problems 
and persuading people to work right from the beginning with very soft edges, focusing on the big shapes, getting the value relationships right, um, and creating strong compositions right from the start. And the difference is amazing. Okay? And I'm putting that together with careful modeling of light and shadow in full color. If you can get the right colors for the highlight, the light light, the dark light, the half tone, and of course the shadow, then you can absolutely nail the form. And if you can paint that opaquely over these deep, soft and mysterious shadows with soft edges, you get a depth and life to your work that you can't get any other way. And then when it comes to adding the details at the end of the piece, You'll be surprised how little you need to add to create the impression of a full and finished painting. So if you want to learn this process of working with soft edges, big shapes, strong compositions, if you want to learn glazing technique, how to model form with opaque paint, light and shadow in full colour, then this might be the workshop for you. We're going to be running for about six weeks. There's going to be six live sessions. There will also be supporting videos too and practice exercises, beautiful reference photos to work from. Um, and there's also a friendly and private community for you to join. So I hope I'll see you soon. There you go. That, I'm actually amazed that worked. <laughs> so that that's much easier than I can explain it about what this what the workshop is about. So either leave me. Uh, you can get in touch with me um, on my website, um, or uh, if you um, you can go onto that that page that I just sent you if you're interested in it. Or you can also actually a better way is. Um, if you're not already subscribed to my email list, it's probably a good idea too, because there is a discount for people who sign up for that early. Um, which you can get if you... Um, Is this working? I don't know if this is working. There, you can pop onto my onto my email list if you want if you're not already subscribed, and that is uh, a good way to get hold of a discount. And there's a couple of other bonus videos involved in that as well. So listen, I I really hope you enjoyed this today. Um, how long were we on? I don't know. An hour was it? An hour? A bit more. Hour and a half maybe. Well, I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> when you've seen in that video, this is the painting. So you can see, like, this is a very similar effect on the squash now. Um, you know, and that came from a very similar, just glazes and opaque painting in the lights, modeling light and shadow over a, um, over a value study. But the key is to start off with the big shapes. Um, not to worry about the things that you're painting and, to, and just to worry about the big shapes of light and shadow. And um, then you will find that, um, like I've just got some, see the hard part is to stop fiddling. I've got some little marks on this now that I want to take out, smooth it out a little bit more. Um, I forgot what I was saying. I need a cup of tea. <laughs> okay, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to be going on a few, uh, probably another couple of times this week and probably a little bit next week as well. Um, and then um, the workshop's going to start on the 12th of December, so I probably will be a bit busy then and, and might not be doing any streams for a little while until the new year. But we'll see. Hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot for coming. Bye.